In the gay science, Nietzsche writes, I would not know what the spirit of a philosopher might wish more than to be a good dancer. For dance is his ideal, also his art, and finally also his only piety, his service of God. In the opening paragraph of her book, Nietzsche's Dancers, Isidore Duncan, Martha Graham, and the Revaluation of Christian Values, Kimberer Lamoth writes, in commentary on this passage, on the pages of Nietzsche's text, multitudes dance, Dionysian revelers, satyrs of the tragic chorus, and Dionysus himself, medieval Christians, free spirits, inspiring muses, and Zarathustra, Gods and goddesses, girls and women, and higher men all dance, so too do thoughts, words, pens, and sometimes even philosophers. The dances performed are as diverse as the performers, differing in rhythm, style, context, and meaning. Nietzsche uses tants, or dance, to describe the activity that occurs during Greek festivities, satyr plays and attic tragedies in the Bible and in Christian history, in social settings and crowds, dance appears as art, religion, recreation, as a discipline, a language of gestures, and an experience of rapturous intoxication. In nearly all of Nietzsche's books, from the birth of tragedy to Ecce Homo and the posthumous will to power, images of dancers and dancing appear with remarkable consistency. Why? Why dance? What significance do these images carry in the context of Nietzsche's philosophy? While other philosophers we've studied try their hand at music, sometimes performing music as a hobby. Nietzsche most of all wished that he had been a musician or composer and not a philosopher. You can listen to many of his not-so-great compositions performed by various pianists. Sometimes Nietzsche wished for nothing so much as to be accepted by the composers of his time. Wagner laughed at this ambition, and Nietzsche alienated Brahms when he sent him the score for his hymn to life. The Birth of Tragedy focuses more on music, Dionysian music in particular, which Nietzsche sees on the edge of rebirth in Wagner's infinite melodies, such as in Tristan and Isolde. But when you look at the underlying notebooks and workshops for Nietzsche's production of the basic ideas of the Birth of Tragedy, dance and the gestures of the body are even more important than his theories of tonal and musical harmony. Nietzsche is not only a philosopher who danced, the only philosopher in the Western tradition who, across his writings, provides a fairly extensive philosophy of dance. Nietzsche's aesthetics, and his philosophy as a whole, is performed gesturally across his writings. But as Lamoth notes, in Philosophy and Religious Studies, an authority no less than Martin Heidegger set the terms within which Nietzsche studies continues to unfold. In Heidegger's two-volume Nietzsche Lectures, published in 1961, derived from lectures and essays from 1936 to 1944, he crowned Nietzsche as the greatest metaphysician, if the last, and based this claim on a collection of Nietzsche's unpublished notes, later edited after her brother's death by Elizabeth Forster Nietzsche as the will to power. In establishing Nietzsche as the last metaphysician, according to Lamoth, Heidegger does not pay sufficient heed to Nietzsche's images of dance. In the wake of Heidegger's reading, two currents of Nietzsche scholarship emerge that continue to dominate the field. A first wave of commentators aligns with Heidegger to a greater and lesser extent in defending the coherence of Nietzsche's writings as a philosophy against charges of him as a nihilist, immoralist, or Nazi enabler. A second stream of commentators, the postmodern ones, resist Heidegger's conclusions in calling attention to Nietzsche's styles and metaphors, the forms of his writing, as challenging the possibility of accomplishing metaphysical projects at all. Lamoth's contribution to Nietzsche's aesthetics of dance, from the birth of tragedy to the latest writings, thus begins by taking issue, as most books on Nietzsche do nowadays, with Heidegger's Nietzsche. I'll be focusing this lecture today on Heidegger's overall reading of Nietzsche's aesthetics in volume one of his Nietzsche lectures, keeping in mind Lamoth's volley against Heidegger's Nietzsche and returning to her reading of Isidore Duncan as a Dionysian artist at the end. Heidegger will also serve in this context as an introduction to the middle and later period views of Nietzsche on art, and how aesthetics and the philosophy of art continue to function in his philosophy after the birth of tragedy. Nietzsche's own later accounts of the birth of tragedy in his attempt at self-criticism, the notebooks, and Ecce Homo is sympathetic but not flattering. He is especially critical of his usage of Kantian, Hegelian, and Schopenhauerian metaphysical formulas in a confused hodgepodge and of his erstwhile devotion to Wagner. What Nietzsche remains positive about throughout his productive life is his main contribution in that work, which is the rediscovery or recovery of the Dionysian, 
and the question of the relation of art to truth. Very early in my life, I took the question of the relation of art to truth seriously. Even now, I stand in holy dread in the face of this discordance. My first book was devoted to it. The Birth of Tragedy believes in art on the background of another belief, that it is not possible to live with truth, that the will to truth is already a symptom of degeneration. We have art in order not to perish from the truth. Heidegger seeks to explain and criticize these passages from Nietzsche by way of a review of Nietzsche's aesthetics and its five basic statements, all culled from the Will to Power notebooks. Heidegger's task is to characterize Nietzsche's total conception of the essence of art. Heidegger's lectures on Nietzsche's aesthetics also provide a helpful overview of the history of Western aesthetics and philosophy of art, even more so than the introduction to Schelling's philosophy of art. But before working through them with a view to evaluating the moth's folly that Heidegger undertreats Nietzsche on dance and the gestural body, it is first necessary to provide a disclaimer or trigger warning regarding reading Heidegger, as well as pursuing a further digression on Nietzsche's relationship to music. Although published much later, these lectures were initially delivered between 1936 and 1940, and they thus find Heidegger in the intellectual climate of the Nazi interpretation of Nietzsche. Heidegger's own main statement in the philosophy of art, his essay, The Origin of the Work of Art, was initially developed in Heidegger's pre-Nazi phase and delivered later. His engagement with Nietzsche's aesthetics and philosophy of art can be seen as a reckoning with and a critique of the ways in which art and the physiology of art in Nietzsche's later notebook has been appropriated by national socialist interpreters. Given that some Nazi functionaries had been hired to spy on these lectures of Heidegger's, Heidegger's task in, this, in these lectures must be seen as walking a delicate tightrope. From our point of view, Heidegger's focusing in on Nietzsche's statements on art in the Will to Power notebooks can seem almost backwards and perverse. Why not focus on the middle period published works of Nietzsche, such as The Gay Science and Beyond Good and Evil and many others? How sympathetic is Heidegger in these lectures to National Socialism? How much are his critiques of Nietzsche's aesthetics and metaphysics of art? Indeed, the sensitive reader reading Heidegger's Nietzsche lectures will find many troubling statements, a great deal of sexism and chauvinism, some hedging into and around the ideologies of the will to power, and even an emphasis on the strength of self-overcoming in terms of the grand style. Despite, or rather because of all these politically charged contexts, it is important that we read Heidegger on Nietzsche's aesthetics critically and carefully. And when we do so, it is hard to avoid the conclusion that Heidegger's lectures are intended to be devastating to prevalent National Socialist interpretations of Nietzsche, but without throwing out, as it were, the baby with the bathwater. While it may be true that Heidegger's Nietzsche successfully dismantles the Nazi Nietzsche, this context itself may prove to be fatal, insofar as Heidegger's Nietzsche remains altogether too much embroiled in a crypto fascioid Nietzsche of his own. In order to understand the relation of dance and music in Nietzsche's life and times, Nietzsche's overall philosophy of music, which I'll do now by way of Rudiger Safransky's biography on Nietzsche. Safransky writes that Nietzsche experienced music as authentic reality and colossal power. Music penetrated the core of his being. It meant everything to him. He hoped the music would never stop, but it did, and he faced the quandary of how to carry on with his existence. Without music, life is ominous, an error. Safransky comments that Nietzsche's whole philosophy originated in a post-Sirenian melancholy identifying his own concept of the Dionysian with Wagnerian infinite melody. Nietzsche imagines an unending melody in which you lose the shore and surrender to the waves. As Heidegger also notes, Nietzsche's conflict with Wagner did not emerge from their mutual love of the Dionysian or infinite melody, but rather that Wagner's art and music gave itself over too completely to the Dionysian. Nietzsche's intention was more Apollonian. The rapture of music in The Birth of Tragedy is for Nietzsche an eradication of ordinary boundaries and limits of existence. When Nietzsche's Apollonian will sobers up, it succumbs to a will-nullifying frame of mind. And at this moment, Nietzsche resembles Hamlet, who becomes revolted by the world and even by his mentor's music, but can no longer brace himself to act. Sounding a bit like Thomas Hobbes, man, Nietzsche contends, is a being that seeks pleasure not just at fixed intervals, but perpetually. In this way, nature has forced humanity on the path of pleasure contrivance. Flight from boredom and our own limitations is thus the mother of all art. Art itself being the path opened up through the techniques of perpetual pleasure. 
When Nietzsche sobered up from his love of Wagner around 1877, he sought to desecrate art, to cool his fervor in anti-romantic self-treatment. The result in his book Human All Too Human was an inversion of the order of precedence of moral values and a shift from a metaphysical to a physical and physiological outlook on the world. By the time of the gay science and thus spoke Zarathustra, the Dionysian, though unnamed by Nietzsche, returns to him, now privileging gesture and dance over music and infinite melody. Nietzsche envisions himself as an atlas hoisting the problems of the world onto his shoulders and managing to romp and gamble with the heavy burden. The acrobatic and buoyant language of thus spoke Zarathustra, along with all of Zarathustra's dance metaphors, is thus Nietzsche's answer to Wagner's infinite melody. Wagner himself had an important revolutionary past. He had conspired with the famous anarchist Mikhail Bakunin in Dresden and participated in street fights, after which he fled to Switzerland and wrote a famous essay, Art and Revolution. When the young Nietzsche read this essay, he exclaimed, Down with all art that does not, by its very nature, urge to the revolution of society and the renewal and unity of the people. Safransky comments, Without a revolution in society, art will be unable to find its way back to its true essence. However, artists have no need to wait for a revolution. They can work towards the emancipation of society by initiating liberation in their own domain. For both Wagner and Nietzsche, art can convey the true meaning of existence. The highest purpose of humanity is artistic. Nietzsche critiqued Wagner and the art of his day as sensuous tone painting, as a world of theatricality and fake actors, in which meaning and existence is understood in terms of having an impact. It was not only in Wagner's opera that we see this tendency towards obscurity and deliberate esotericism. Safransky points out how the sensuous paintings of Nietzsche's contemporaries such as Han Makart and Franz Stuck also emerge out of the drive to have a public based on accommodation, provocation, and mystification. Here you see Makart's The Five Senses, his triumph of Ariadne, a theme of course also central to Nietzsche, above all in his poetry or Dionysian dithrams and the image of the young Macart as a self-styled Don Quixote in the realm of the sensuous. Art like this is thrilling but was not quite what Nietzsche was after. Although it would be hard to say that Nietzsche ever matured beyond or grew above this sort of art in his own self-image as a satyr in the Dionysian chorus. The leading art of Nietzsche's time and the one in which he was most invested was not painting but music. Safransky notes that music even predates language with its Tower of Babel. From Bach to Pop, music is the universal mode of communication, which triumphs over the confusion of tongues. The notion that music is closer to our essence than any other product of our consciousness goes back to the beginning of human history, and the early Nietzsche takes on board this proposition wholeheartedly. Although music has become an all-pervasive white noise, atmosphere, milieu, or acoustic backdrop of our entire existence, we seldom think of it as such, and barely notice that a substantial portion of the human population now lives in the extra-linguistic and pre-linguistic Dionysian sphere of rock, pop, or, nowadays, Spotify. Music is political because its inundation of human consciousness knows no bounds. It erodes political terrains and ideologies, it alters consciousness, it reveals different forms of being, and it unites the community of its listeners. Leibniz may be right that the human soul has turned into a windowless monad, but at least we're not isolated so long as we love the same music. Music creates social coherence in the stratum of our consciousness and continues to be a mythical dimension of human life. The young Nietzsche cherished this colossal power of music and yearned for the return of a tragic outlook on life that would value Dionysian wisdom, music and dance over science. But he found himself in an epoch that was celebrating one scientific triumph after the other. Positivism, empiricism, economics, utilitarian thinking defined the age. Scientific optimism reigned supreme. By the summer of 1877, he declared explicitly to readers of his earlier work that he has relinquished the metaphysical and artistic views that are essentially dominated by those early works. Those works were agreeable but untenable. The middle and later Nietzsche thus begins a period of ambivalence towards art and artists. On the one hand, art remains a counter-movement to nihilism, a justification of life, and a necessary world-building activity without which life would not be worth living. On the other hand, the world of art comes to loggerheads in Nietzsche's thought with that of science, and truth, his own personality bearing the strain of this dreadful discordance. <laughs>
Okay, digression over, we're now in a better position to be able to understand the cultural context in light of which Heidegger writes his Nietzsche lectures, and to better recognize and interpret how Heidegger's main target in Nietzsche's aesthetics is not just the biologistic or physiological interpretation of Nietzsche on art, but the idealization of sensuous tone painting and the elevation of music and the Gesamtkunstwerk as such. For Heidegger, what Nietzsche and the modern aesthetics that he expresses has forgotten is being. We forget being not because we have too little music, dance, will, or power in our lives, but because we emerge into the context of a world historical oblivion, an inauthenticity from which it is very difficult to escape. Summing up Plato's definition of poesis in the symposium, that is the most general catch-all definition for the essence of art we've encountered in the course so far, Heidegger writes that to be an artist is to be able to bring something forth, but to bring forth means to establish in being something that does not yet exist. Heidegger uses this insight in order to understand a sentence from Nietzsche, the phenomena artist is still the most perspicacious. A glance at the online etymological dictionary defines perspicacious or perspicacity as sharp-sightedness, acute mental discernment, the power of seeing through, or intense observation. In describing the phenomena artist as the most perspicacious, Nietzsche is suggesting that artists and art are essentially revealing. The artist and his psychology is a mirror for how the will to power is configured aesthetically. For Nietzsche, we come to understand the dynamics of the will to power, or fundamental conatus of life, when we examine the psychology of the artist. This leads Heidegger to Nietzsche's second basic statement in aesthetics, that art must be grasped in terms of the artist. It is from the position of creativity that we may scan the basic instincts of power, of nature, also of religion and morality. So the guiding principle of Nietzsche's teaching on art is that art must be grasped in terms of creators and producers, not recipients. Nietzsche expresses this unequivocally in the following words from The Will to Power, quote, Our aesthetics heretofore has been a woman's aesthetics. Heidegger notes the masculinist parsing or bias here in Nietzsche's aesthetics, and feminist interpreters of Martin Heidegger have been quick to take up this point. In various passages of the Will to Power notebooks, Nietzsche celebrates an active, productive, or masculinist aesthetic, suggesting that receptivity aesthetics is somehow to be associated with woman. According to Heidegger's analysis and critique of Nietzsche's metaphysics, for Nietzsche, being itself is life. The essence of being or life is the will to power. So when we ask, what is the essence of the world, the being of life, the universe, and everything? The answer, in terms of the later Nietzsche's metaphysics, is that this world is will to power and nothing besides, and you yourselves are the will to power. Moving through the first and the second statements about art, this leads Heidegger to the third statement. According to Nietzsche's expanded concept of artist, art is the basic occurrence of all beings. To the extent that they are, beings are self-creating. Being itself, or life, is essentially the activity of augmenting and enhancing one's creative will. According to the fourth statement, our religion, morality, and philosophy are decadence forms of humanity. The counter-movement is art. In other words, religion, morality, and philosophy, so far in human history, the history of the human spirit, have not everywhere and at all times recognized themselves as art forms. Thus, in the fourth statement, art is the distinctive counter-movement, denialism. So Heidegger's first elucidation of the five key statements is meant in this first lecture to be very introductory. Four more lectures follow before Heidegger returns to the five statements in order to ground them. And only by working through these four lectures carefully and then reading his grounding understanding of the five statements are we in a position to situate and critically understand the fifth statement that art is worth more than truth. In order to approach this statement and how it informs the first four, what we need is a review of the history of aesthetics, and this is what Heidegger goes on to provide. According to Heidegger, Nietzsche's aesthetics somersaults beyond itself. Art has been taken to be a relation of subject to object, that is, a lived subjective experience of the artwork as object. There is the aesthetic feeling or receptivity aroused by the beautiful, and then there is the aesthetic state itself or the creativity which engenders art. Heidegger notes that although the Greeks did not have a philosophy of art, even in Plato and Aristotle, the Western philosophical meditation on art begins in some sense as aesthetics. Looking at contemporary aesthetics, Heidegger remarks that it has contributed virtually nothing to aesthetic creativity 
or the sound appreciation of art. But our standards not derive from contemporary art and contemporary aesthetics, but from a decisive meditation on history. Heidegger's six-point review of the history of aesthetics therefore begins by acknowledging that the Greeks made great art, but not as art in the modern sense. We still don't fully understand them. They knew no aesthetic sphere of lived experiences. Nevertheless, aesthetics begins in Plato and Aristotle insofar as they organize all reality in terms of the distinction of matter and form, Greek hule morphe, Latin materia forma, where form is understood as what shows itself radiantly, i.e. aesthetically, especially in the experience of the beautiful as ex phanestaton, that which shines forth most clearly from itself. The Greeks, Heidegger noted, also invented the idea of art as techne and as poesis, and both techne and poesis are specific kinds of relating to phusis or nature. This first Western concept of art originates in the mastery and supersession of nature as well as the productive knowledge that is guided by nature. Techne for Heidegger is less related to being guided by the model or form in the production of repeatable things or in mere handiwork, but techne is to be understood as the eruption of new and beautiful things. By the modern age, the world became so full with human produced things that aesthetics came to mean something more like taste or subjective discernment. This does not mean there wasn't subjective taste from the beginning, only that our basic relation to beings gradually shifted towards aesthetics. In modernity, meditation on the beautiful in art slips markedly, even exclusively, into the relationship of man's state of feeling. The aesthetic state comes to be associated with the history of great art. Rather than opening up the unconditioned, the absolute for us, humanity became so severed from being that art became an absolute need. Thus Heidegger agrees with Hegel that at the historical moment when aesthetics achieved its greatest possible height, breadth, and rigor of form, great art came to an end. And so the final and greatest aesthetics in the Western tradition is that of Hegel. We think we need art, as Rilke warns, as a bomb on the tired and unfortunate aspects of our lives. And art is approached in the art industry as a human need, the relation of producers and consumers as a human need or demand that must be satisfied. And yet precisely this neediness that we have in regards to art as a separate domain bespeaks the fact that there is no absolute need for great art in our lives. We can very well do without art as an opening up of the truth of being or presentation of the absolute. And no longer being needed, great art becomes a thing of the past. This is where Heidegger's review becomes particularly relevant for his treatment of Nietzsche's aesthetics. In the wake of Hegel's proclamation of the death of art, the later 19th century once more dares to attempt the collective artwork. In other words, 19th century art was in a do or die position. It needed to claim the absolute revelation of truth to a community or acquiesce in the death of art. And this is how Heidegger explains the phenomena of Richard Wagner, i.e. the first global Dionysiac pop star loved by all of Europe and especially in Heidegger's time by the Nazis. Heidegger considers the whole milieu that gave rose to Wagner between 1850 and 1860 confused. On the one hand, the second renaissance of German classicism, idealism, and romanticism is still spiritually present. On the other, there is a universal uprooting of human essence that gives rise to the Gilded Age. Heidegger helpfully remarks here that we can never understand a century from its center. We need one third of a century before it begins and one third of a century after it ends to even know what took place. It is in the context of the late 19th century rebirth of the collective artwork that Nietzsche's aesthetics must be situated as a problem for the early 20th century. Now Heidegger notes that the collective artwork is important as a response to the death of art and as a celebration of a national community and possibly as a rebirth of religion. But clearly only very widely read and heard literary and musical works are qualified to play this role for the collective. Nowadays it is music or plot Netflix that defines the spirit of the times. In theory, as a combination of music and literature, the ideal art form of the collective artwork needs to be drama or theater, opera. The other fine arts, architecture, sculpture, painting, are ornamental. Something goes terribly wrong between Nietzsche's time and our own. Rather than literature or poesis, music tends to dominate the aesthetic state and eschew its relation with thoughtful poetry. And the result is, in Wagner, Dionysian tumult or delirium, resonance culture, lived experience and theatrics that is the return of a merely 
ritualistic performance culture. For Nietzsche, the difference between passive and active aesthetics between the artist and the audience is lost in Wagner's version of the collective artwork. The artist's Dionysian job becomes that of creating a continuum or fluid medium in which the fans experience their reality as a liquid, soft, impressionable, ethereal surface, a sea of feeling. Nietzsche considers these effects by Wagner's opera to be pure hypnotism. Most artists today as well are theatrical and reckless, yet we learn so much from them, remarks Heidegger. We are also made passive by them in our very being. They patch work a need. As Heidegger notes, it is the art of music, the most trance-like and hypnotic of arts, which assumes predominance in modern societies and the collective artwork idea. And in this way, music plays itself out into a growing barbarism and abandonment of the project of the aesthetic education of humanity from Plato to Schiller. Heidegger thus accounts for the breach between Nietzsche and Wagner. It was the frenzied plunge into the whole of things in Wagner's person and work that captivated the young Nietzsche, yet his captivation was possible only because something correlative came from him, what he then called the Dionysian. But since Wagner sought sheer absurgence of the Dionysian upon which one might ride, while Nietzsche sought to leash its force and give it form, the Apollonian, the breach between the two was already predetermined. Heidegger goes on to explain in some detail for his auditors, among whom there may have been Nazi functionaries, the Nietzsche-Wagner relationship, and points out that Nietzsche loved Wagner all his life, but objected to Wagner's neglect of inner feeling and proper style. According to Nietzsche, Wagner is all floating and swimming instead of striding and dancing, striding and dancing being more secure in measure and pace. Note here that Heidegger's historical situating of Nietzsche in the history of aesthetics in European art is against the cultural hypnotism of music and does point out the middle and later Nietzsche's poetics of dance and gesture. Sorry, Lamoth. Heidegger also notes that Nietzsche's taste in art is far from exhausted by his history with Wagner. Nietzsche loved the work of the poet-painter Stifter, who he calls the opposite of Wagner. Thomas Mann remarks on Stifter, one of the most extraordinary, the most enigmatic, the most secretly daring, the most strangely gripping narrators in all world literature. Stifter's work, in his own estimation, there exists a serene, unfathomable abyss in which God and the spirits dwell. The soul in moments of ecstasy often stores across it. Poetry unveils it at times with childlike naivete, but science with its hammer and yardstick is often perched at the rim and may in many cases contribute nothing at all. For Heidegger, this can be interpreted as meaning that what in the age of Herder and Winkelmann stood in service to a magnificent self-meditation on humanity's historical existence increasingly becomes scientized, carried on for its own sake as an academic discipline, and it is only in the late 19th century that research into the history of art as such begins. Heidegger points to three consequences. One, the collective artwork turns into a scientific or analytic philosophical dominion over art. Two, people start to think of themselves as artistic and attempt to balance and harmonize the dimensions of their lived experience. This is a bit like the New Age Nietzsche in the School of Life video, it's all about balance. Three, humans come to relate to art and the aesthetic state in a way that befits their own last human way of life and happiness. And the result of all this is nihilism. So Heidegger's final point in his review or summary of the history of aesthetics is that where we stand now is that we still can't really decide between Hegel's and Nietzsche's aesthetics. Hegel was clear that art is dying, coming to an end, no longer a presentation of the absolute and Nietzsche attempted to renew the being and becoming of art as a something different in regards to truth and b as a fantastical grounding of the history of the self. All this is necessary to explain how Nietzsche was a a great philosopher but b one with some pretty bad ideas at the same time. His defining of art and the aesthetic state in the language of physiology or biology is regrettable, understandable given the pincers of the age in which he lived. Nietzsche looked to Richard Wagner for a rebirth of art, but this art form was itself in the throes of world historical developments in the history of technology. Art becoming arousal of frenzied feelings and unchained affects that are supposed to rescue life. Our spiritual poverty and the deterioration of existence occasioned by industry, technology, and finance, and the final enervation and depletion of the constructive forces of knowledge and tradition caused art and philosophy in Nietzsche's case to rise on the swells of feeling.
Nietzsche's lifelong reproach to Wagner was that he took Nietzsche's assistance too lightly. Only Wagner had been the amanuensis for Nietzsche's vision of a new art world. For only great poetry and thought can save us from the rush of the art industry to entertainment that begins with Richard Wagner. Nowadays, we are so inundated by digital pre-produced musico-visual cultures as well as live variants that in such an environment, art can no longer be mimesis of tradition, but it becomes production impact. To be is to have an impact. In such a context for Heidegger, art surrenders to inframing or the gestell, i.e. to a metaphysical or as we would say now, AI or algorithmic coordination of technological perfection and production for a new era and culture, and in this way art becomes by necessity a kind of applied physiology. Nietzsche was himself a kind of pioneer for the naturalistic, physiological, functional, or evolutionary explanation of art and the activity of artists. How to reconcile art as a counter-movement to nihilism in Nietzsche and art as an object of physiology? This is, he remarks, like trying to mix fire with water. Nietzsche was a bad alchemist in this instance. For Heidegger, the world that art opens up to us and reveals does not come with a pre-provided rubric by which works of art can be evaluated. Science is a system of laws of sequence and commensurability and meaning transfer, but art opens up a world where singularity and incommensurability is the norm. To deliver art over to physiology is tantamount to reducing art to the functional level of gastric juices. With these caveats and warnings in mind, Heidegger turns in section 14 to Nietzsche's understanding of rapture as the basic aesthetic state. Although Nietzsche himself interprets his concept of rapture or rausch within a physiology of art in the Will to Power notebooks, a closer, more philosophical analysis of the type that Heidegger provides reveals that rapture and the physiology of art have their limits as philosophical descriptions. He thus begins this chapter by asking, is your genuine intention to transform your will to power into a distinctive form, i.e. no longer blushing, running away from the supreme standards you hold yourself accountable to? This is indeed the fundamental position or view opened up by Nietzsche's aesthetics. But note how Heidegger hedges here. A genuine intention may in fact be quite misguided and very far from an authentic existential structure. So what is art for Nietzsche? Is it full of meaning, sensible, full of being and truth, or is it a meaningless diversion, a merely physiological or psychical phenomena? For Nietzsche, the aesthetic state is defined as rapture, an overflowing well-being that wants to gift itself through the offering of creative work. Nietzsche writes, If there is to be art, if there is to be any aesthetic doing or observing, one physiological precondition is indispensable, rapture. Rapture must have first augmented the excitability of the entire human machine, else it does not come to art. All the variously conditioned forms of rapture have the requisite force, above all the rapture of sexuality, the oldest and most original form of rapture. There is also the rapture of feast, contest, daring, victory, extreme movement, cruelty, destruction, meteorological influences, springtime, narcotics, and finally the rapture of a full and overteeming will. These remarks arrive in Nietzsche's Twilight of the Idols, so they are published ones. By saying that rapture is a physiological precondition for the aesthetic state and thus for art, Nietzsche for Heidegger is grounding aesthetics and art in embodied feeling. He writes, We do not have a body in the way we carry a knife in a sheath. We do not have a body, rather we are bodily. We live in so far as we are embodied. Where to be bodily is to be determined in advance by moods or attunements, like rapture. Now why is rapture in particular indispensable for art and the basic aesthetic state? What is essential in rapture is the feeling of enhancement of force and plenitude, a feeling in which the unity of embodying attunement prevails. While states of intoxication are related to rapture, rapture is not for Heidegger being intoxicated, soused, but rather enraptured within the enhancement of force and plenitude. Being merely intoxicated, on the other hand, is something that, quote, deprives us of every possible state of being. The idea of rapture, or bodily enhancement and plenitude, leads Heidegger to the third aspect of rapture that Nietzsche notes, the reciprocal penetration of all enhancements and every ability to do and see, apprehend and address, communicate and achieve release. In a way, Heidegger and Nietzsche are providing a phenomenological description of rapture as the creative or the festive state that underlies the production or origin of art. 
is in the chapter Rapture as Aesthetic State that Heidegger reckons with the relation of Nietzsche's early to his last aesthetics. Lear concurs that Nietzsche's The Birth of Tragedy indeed states something essential when it points to the two artistic states of dream and enchantment. The Apollonian and the Dionysian are, you will recall, the two forces of art and nature in relation to which every human artist is an imitator. Reviewing how the Apollonian-Dionysian duality is misunderstood to some extent by Nietzsche himself in terms of Schopenhauer's metaphysics, he underlines Nietzsche's 1888 work Twilight of the Idols and the Will to Power notebooks as locations in which the Apollonian and the Dionysian are understood as a unity determined by rapture rather than a dialectical or metaphysical opposition. Heidegger also points out here how Nietzsche derives the Apollonian-Dionysian distinction in part from his study of the great Renaissance scholar Burckhardt, although he himself misses the degree to which this fundamental advance in aesthetics was communicated to Nietzsche through his early reading of Friedrich Hödlin. At this point, Heidegger realizes he has raised more questions regarding the aesthetic state as rapture than he has resolved. Rapture is a feeling, an embodying attunement, an embodied being that is contained in attunement and attunement woven into embodiment. To it, it is an attunement that lays open human existence as enhancing and conducts it into the plenitude of its capacities as they mutually arouse one another and foster enhancement. What Schiller had called the play drive as the liminal enhancing and augmenting of both sense and form based in Kant's doctrine of the play of the faculties, Heidegger picks up through Nietzsche's aesthetics and defines as a mood or feeling rapture. Accordingly, if we want to fully understand the structure of this basic aesthetic mode of human existence, we will have to return to Kant, to Kant's doctrine of the beautiful. Here Heidegger argues that due to Schopenhauer's influence, Nietzsche fatally misunderstood Kant on the beautiful. However, in Nietzsche's own conception of the beautiful, which he presents in opposition to Kant, he is considered more carefully in fundamental agreement with Kant. The misunderstanding hinges around what Kant means when he says that the judgment of the beautiful, to be subjectively universal, must be devoid of all interest. What is wrong with Nietzsche's conception of the aesthetic state as rapture is that it is intended to be the opposite of Kant's disinterested delight. But when we look more deeply into Kant's comportment towards the beautiful, we must recognize that what Kant meant by devoid of all interest or disinterested delight is in fact an unconstrained favoring or the pleasure of reflection, letting the beautiful be in such a way that we sojourn along with its appearance in the pleasure of reflection. The reflective judgment of the beautiful as an unconstrained favoring is thus part of what Nietzsche really meant by rapture, as an embodied attunement that brings us into the plenitude of our capacities. In fact, according to Heidegger, Nietzsche is much closer to Kant in his aesthetics than he himself came to believe in his later writings. In answer to the question, what is the beautiful, Nietzsche writes, my view, what is beautiful, observed historically, is what is visible in the most honored men of an era as an expression of what is most worthy of honor. Purely to honor what is of worth in its appearance is for Kant the essence of the beautiful. So Nietzsche's only real advance here is to expand this unconstrained favoring of the beautiful into something of historical significance and greatness. And when Nietzsche says the beautiful itself exists just as little as the good and the true, this too corresponds to the opinion of Kant. Where Nietzsche went wrong for Heidegger was to assume that the value of the beautiful is completely anthropocentric based on biological presuppositions concerning growth and progress, that aesthetic value rests on biological value, and that aesthetic delights are biological delights. It's not that there are not physiological and biological preconditions and structures, but rather that when we reduce aesthetic experience to the biological, we have mischaracterized it. To say that the aesthetic state is explosive is a chemical metaphor not a philosophical interpretation. In the sections on rapture as form engendering force, the grand style, and the grounding of the five statements of art, Heidegger's interpretation of Nietzsche's aesthetics only gets more and more interesting. Having introduced the basics of Heidegger's critique of Nietzsche's aesthetics, I will leave the interpretation of these sections to a later video. In conclusion and returning to Lamoth on Nietzsche's dancers, I think we can safely point out that just as Lamoth criticizes Heidegger's Nietzsche for diffusing dance to some extent, read more generously, the absence of focus on the aesthetics and poetics of dance only occurs because Heidegger has the project of diffusing music.
his emphasis on embodiment as an ontological structure to be distinguished from biologistic interpretation in fact leads Heidegger into the same terrain of questions and problems that are raised in Nietzsche's philosophy of dance. Heidegger's Nietzsche opens up many research projects, many of them designed to heal the rift proposed by Nietzsche of a fundamental raging discordance between art and truth. Okay, I hope you've enjoyed your video for this week and I'll see you next week.